Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the second Law of Self-Defense show in one day. Wow. What a absolute treat this is going to be for all of you. And uh, I hope it inspires all of you to become better American citizens by learning the actual law of the U.S. Constitution. Of course, everyone ought to know by now. I am attorney Andrew Branca. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's always so humbling. And we have a very, very special guest with us tonight, and that is the professor of our American Law Courses Constitutional Law class, Linda Denno. Welcome, Linda, to the Law of Self-Defense community. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'm so excited to be here. What a privilege this is. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, an uns How should I say? Uncensored talking about the Constitution. Yes, there is no political correctness on uh, anything we do here at American Law Courses. That's that's one of the reasons we launched American Law Courses was specifically to get away from the political toxicity that is so pervasive in today's law schools. I'm shocked. I, I go to lecture at law schools occasionally, and I'm just shocked at how different it is in a mere, a mere 30 years uh, since I went. Um, it's completely different. In fact, when we started this series of American Law Courses, I actually went out and repurchased the newest editions of all my old law textbooks. And I was, I guess, shocked is not the right word, disappointed perhaps to find that all of them have a new chapter at the beginning. <laughs> That's all about diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, left-wing propaganda. It sets the tone for the entire textbook. Doesn't matter what the subject is, criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, property, they all have it in there. It's pervasive throughout that environment. And all and we do in American law. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say the reason that 30 years ago, those sort of things started to happen is because they started producing case law books on American constitutional law without the constitution printed in them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, I, I'm serious. Uh, yeah, there were quite a few of them. Never mind things like the, the, you know, I, uh, excerpts from the Federalist Papers and whatnot, uh, they actually started making American constitutional law textbooks without the Constitution, even. But that, that's even convenient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You if imagine. you'd like to sidestep the Constitution, yeah. that's always helpful. It is a troublesome document uh, for people who would like an intrusive government uh, presence, because, of course, uh, especially with, with the focus in this con law class, as we'll step through it, it's, it's on the Bill of Rights, which are all really constraints on the federal government or most of them, the large majority of them are s serving to constrain the, sc the scope and authority of the federal government. Uh, and you'll f uh, you might find this a bit surprising, but one of the arguments I make to students is the argument that Hamilton makes in Federalist 84. And one of the things we'll be talking about in this course is sort of two parallel arguments. One is the the over-reliance, and I'm talking to a lawyer when I say this, so I know I've been getting into, but the over-reliance on the judiciary to decide important constitutional questions for us, I should probably uh, amend that to say the over-reliance on the judiciary to decide political questions under the guise of constitutional questions for us, number one, but also a, a little bit deeper subject which about the Bill of Rights, which is that Hamilton in Federalist Number 84 talks at great length about how why the original constitution did not have a bill of rights, how it is both unnecessary and very possibly dangerous. And this is, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that point, I, the dangerous part, but whether it was unnecessary, you know, it's a, it's a tough call. And I think we'll, we'll be discussing that. You think about the second amendment, would we have uh, a commitment to the idea that the people can indeed have an individual right to keep and bear arms if we didn't have an, a, a second amendment. It's a tough call, but at the same time, we didn't even have a ruling on the second amendment, you might say until 2008, but we all recognized a very basic idea that we need the second amendment, that we need the right to keep and bear arms as part of our right to revolution as a protection against governmental tyranny. But when we have an amendment, then we let the court define what that right is, as opposed to us demanding what our rights are and demanding that the, that the government 
explain to us where they get the power in the first place to take away our rights. That's We'll talk about that um, at some length in um, our discussion of the Bill of Rights uh, overall in a kind of a summary way at the beginning. It's just an interesting idea. We we as lawyers tend to look at the idea that we must carve out rights from the government when in fact the whole constitution was designed to be a limitation on the powers of government. Um, right. In fact, the, the second amendment doesn't give us the right to keep and bear arms, right? It just says the government shall not infringe that right. The rights right. pre-existing. Absolutely. Um, but, but yeah, Madison, that, 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 excuse me, Hamilton says, uh, don't, why, why tell the government that it can't do something it doesn't have the power to do? You might create a pretext for granting more than what was given. That's just an, in, an interesting uh, intellectual activity. I mean, it doesn't matter now. We have a Bill of Rights and most of us are very, very grateful for that. But it, it does take us back to a question of thinking about where our rights come from and how best we protect them. And I sometimes worry that there's an over-reliance on the Supreme Court to protect us, uh, to protect our very important rights against government um, intrusion, against government overreach. And I have lots of examples of where I think that comes from, but I'll save that for the classes. And of course, the Constitution, in it's really a piece of paper, right? It only has the power and authority that we bestow upon it as the human actors living in the real world. Uh, you know, rights can simply, I mean, for many years, the federal courts were writing Second Amendment uh, jurisprudence that was just word salad, uh, just basically completely nullifying any private right to bear arms. That's why we had to have McDonald. Uh, that's why we had to have Heller. And now, of course, most recently Bruin. But it's not like there's some God of the Constitution that comes down from the sky and makes sure that our rights are not infringed. Uh, these are, you know, all of these decisions are being made by human beings. And I mean, it was written by human beings. The Bill of Rights were written by human beings. And it's probably impossible to have a perfect form of government. I like to think we came pretty darn close um, when the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were written. Uh, but in the intervening couple hundred years plus, we have other human beings, lesser human beings, arguably, uh, and who are tasked with interpreting and applying uh, those constitutional provisions. And it's a, it's a, it's a a daunting task for sure, which and worthy of back, safeguarding. Yes, which would take me back to um, the 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 very real value of the American law courses, Andrew. Because uh, how do I say this? The most important way that citizens keep their government honest, keep their government in check. Madison tells us in Federalist Number Fifty One that the most important check on the government is a dependence on the people. But if the people are unaware of what their constitution means, if the people are unaware of the rights that are protected there, on the limitations of powers, if they're unaware of which branches of government exercise what powers, all of those things. If if the people can't look at, for instance, uh, let me just throw an example out there during COVID. In California, oh, let me use Nevada as a better example. In Nevada, the governor decided that um, casinos could operate, continue to operate with X number of people inside of them, but churches had to close down. That was that executive order was challenged at the Supreme Court, and uh, our esteemed Chief Justice sarcasm there um, decided that that an injunction was not necessary. Um, Never mind the irrationality of why a casino would be different than a uh, than a uh, church, just in terms of people being in the same room together. But the idea that he'd forgotten we have a, a First Amendment that protects the free exercise of religion, refusing to issue an injunction and saying that the court had to defer in this case to executive power and to experts, health, um, uh, public health experts. Um, you know, there's supposedly an example of judicial restraint, but if there was ever a time we needed the Supreme Court to step in and protect our rights, it was in a situation like that. And so I, I'm very, I, I tend to be very critical of many, many Supreme Court decisions because I agree with you. It's human beings who must interpret what this constitution means. It's an, a human beings who must enforce the provisions of the constitution 
it's why we need to pay attention and demand that they do it in a rational way that is consistent with the purposes of the Constitution. And we should demand that, I think, from our Supreme Court. We can't do that unless we understand what the Constitution is really all about and what it was designed to do. Right. It, precisely. That's why we launched American Law Courses to begin with, because you cannot protect what you don't know you possess. If you don't know what your rights actually are, there's no way to defend them. Uh, and you can't object to an infringement that you can't recognize as an infringement. Right. Uh, so unless you know what the actual legal framework is, what the constraints on the government are, you can't make a reasoned and rational objection when the government overreaches. Uh, you can feel bad about it. They're taking my guns. I don't like it. They're closing my church. I don't like it. But that's an emotional response. That's a childlike response. That's not a mature response that can drive you and others to act, exercise your political authority as citizens to not have a government doing that. Well, and I, I go one step further. I would agree, agree with everything you just said, but go one step further and say, where were the people who understood when they they were willing to close down churches, but not casinos, who understood the very incredibly offensive attack on our most, in many ways, I believe our most fundamental right. I go back and forth between whether it's freedom of religion or, or uh, the Second Amendment. Both of those are absolutely critical to maintaining the kind of government we have. And when we had a Supreme Court of the United States, a supposed cons conservative Supreme Court, a supposed Supreme Court that defends religious liberty, uh, deciding that they were not going to second guess what was then becoming very real executive tyranny in many places and legislative tyranny in many places across the country. Where was the Supreme Court in that? If we ever needed a Supreme Court, why did they fail so badly? And why weren't citizens demanding, demanding that something be different? And in fact, my argument would be we should have never relied on the Supreme Court in the first place. We should have as citizens just absolutely um, done like the truckers in Canada, got up in arms and said, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not playing your game. Right. Right. Because the, the further from the citizen the decision making occurs, uh, the, the less possibility we have to influence. And if we're, if we're, I always think this to myself in, in the context of the Second Amendment. I, listen, I love Bruin, I love Heller, I love McDonald. Those are great decisions. They're favorable to my view of the Second Amendment, my right to keep and bear arms. But if we're a nation that's relying on those handful of justices to protect our Second Amendment rights from being despoiled by half the states in the in the country by everybody if the federal government steps in. Um, that's a very weak position, folks. That, that knowledge, that expertise, uh, that understanding of our rights, the, the further away from us it is as individual citizens, the, the least we're able to pull those powers. And, and the, <clears throat> the narrower that bottleneck, so we defer to the Supreme Court, we're deferring to nine people. Maybe we defer to legal experts, right? What do the law professors say about this? But the, the fewer people who are involved in the argument and decision making, the easier it is for them to be compromised. Um, I, I don't mean like through blackmail, but uh, compromised socially, uh, especially if, if you, law professors are working within a law school environment. Uh, nobody wants to seem out of step with their peers. It takes a lot of strength of character to be the, the albino wolf in the pack in a politically energized environment. And those people, even if they don't adopt a position they don't believe in explicitly, they, they just stay silent. And the only voices that are heard are the voices of the opposition. The only way to prevent that is for us to know the law ourselves. That's, it's a fundamental responsibility as American citizen. I guess they don't teach civics anymore. I mean, the number of people I meet who, who don't understand the most simplest facets of things like how a trial occurs or what matters uh, is remarkable. And they certainly don't understand the higher functions of how the Constitution works is supposed to protect our rights and constrain the government. So it's one of the reasons we're, I'm so, I mean, I've been telling everybody for weeks, ever since you agreed to come on board, I'm so pleased to have you teaching the class. It's almost certainly the single most important class we'll have taught at American Law Courses. It's the foundation for, for everything else we do. The, the criminal law courses, the evidence course, the property course, it all comes down to this constitutional law. Yep. I can't, I, can't, I can't add anything to that, quite frankly. Uh, I, I believe the same thing. And, and I also the, I would add one small thing, and that is not only when we have a smaller and smaller number of elites making our decisions for us, are we more in more and more danger of those elites um, 
<clears throat> taking away our rights and liberties. But I think we're starting to see in certainly in recent decades where regardless of political affiliation, regardless of ideological affiliation, there tends to be an elite perspective that, as you, you put it when you said, you know, and it's a law professor in a law school doesn't want to be the outlier, doesn't want to, you know, that that's, that's a hint of it, but I, I honestly see an even more pernicious kind of um, effect across things, which is, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democrat, whatever it might be, you tend to recognize your interests as the same as other elites in power. Here's a silly example, but one of the problems with Chief Justice Roberts is rather than thinking that his job is at all costs to protect the Constitution, what the Constitution itself is designed to protect, he believes it's his job to protect the integrity of the court. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, so, you, so you get it by laughing. I know you exactly right. I, I know exactly what I mean. Yes, it's, it's, it becomes not a sacred duty to the Constitution, but a sacred duty somehow to protect um, against any kind of political bash, backlash against the court and those sorts of things we know, for instance, in the Obamacare case, um, Sebelius versus... S, uh, it's a tax. <laughs> yeah, it's a tax. But but why did he do that? It's because the there was so much outcry against the Supreme Court possibly overturning Obamacare on the left and and in Washington DC, you know, where all of these people, the swamp where they all reside, that he, you know, he found a an unconstitutional mechanism to save that law. What happened as a result of that? Well, when when Do the Dobbs decision of a, a term ago um, came down, you know, they leaked the decision in a, in some hope that they would um, convince the court uh, to go in a different direction. It, what 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 Roberts tried to do didn't work anyway. If he'd have just stood up for what was right under the Constitution all along, we wouldn't see the kind of political uh, efforts to force the court into a more progressive stance, I guess you might say, you know, assassination attempts against justices and protesting outside their houses. So, so back you, your commentary about who is it do we allow to make these decisions for us? We can't even trust what I would call those, you know, happily in many cases, conservative justices of the Supreme Court to be the sole protectors of our rights because they don't necessarily have a different set of interests from the rest of the elites in Washington. In I mean, it's such it's such a bad approach <laughs> for especially for the Supreme Court uh, chief justice, because all he did was tell everybody this is the button you need to push to influence us. We don't like the political drama. Well, then, of course, everyone's going to pound that with a with a hammer mm -hmm. uh, and which which they do it with all these decisions now, uh, like yep. like Dobbs was leaked. It's and he made that he made that happen. He's responsible for that yeah. um, because of the way he conducts the court. It's 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 awful. All right. I want to jump into. Uh, so, of course, when, when uh, Linda agreed to teach the uh, con law class for us, this is the, the summer semester, by the way, folks. It's let's see. I've got something else I can pull up here. Uh, well, I'll pull this back up first. Whoops. Oh, nothing but the highest production values here at law, self-defense and American law courses. Uh, so. The constitutional law class, the course, uh, it's a bunch of classes. It's a semester long course, uh, starts on May 17th, folks, and it runs for about 14 weeks, culminates in a what I'm sure will be a wonderful final exam, which is optional, uh, except if you want a certificate in the class, because we want you to know you actually learn the material if you get the certificate. It starts on May 17th. It's Wednesday evenings. As I recall, I have the specific time here in my next little mm -hmm. document. Uh, and you can sign up for that at AmericanLawCourses.com. That will just bring you to this page here. You can sign up just for constitutional law if you wish, and it's 50% off the normal price for the class right now. Uh, or you can sign up for a bundle of classes. We have a whole bunch of courses, some of which are we've already taught and are available in playback. We'll be coming back as live courses again. Some of them are coming up in the fall and spring semesters. Criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, property, criminal justice, business law, a bunch more. And the more courses you sign up for, the less expensive it becomes per course. So that's for all of you to consider. And all of these have various uh, payment options, too. If you want to pay once, 
that's fine. If you want to pay over time, that's fine too. You'll see all those options there at AmericanLawCourses.com. And Linda, of course, Professor Dano for uh, uh, American Law Courses. And full disclosure, of course, these courses are for your personal education, interest, expertise. We're not an accredited law school. There is no formal degree. Uh, you're not getting credits towards anything. This is uh, for your personal education. Now, I will say this, uh, and we've heard this from a bunch of students, and of course, everybody teaching these courses uh, is trained in the law ourselves. Uh, if, if you're thinking about law school, uh, jumping into one or more of these courses would be a great way to put your toe in the water and see whether or not you like learning the law. Uh, and if you take one of these courses and go to law school, you will crush it. You will kill law school. I wish I'd had this kind of opportunity. For most of us, us lawyers who go through law school, the first time we're exposed to constitutional law is when the grade counts and we're learning it for the first time. And the same with criminal law and evidence and procedure. Um, we've had people go through our education programs before here at Law, Self-Defense and American Law Courses and go on to law school. They loved it so much and become lawyers. And you will be head and shoulders above everybody else if you've gone through these courses before you even get there. Uh, now, OK, Linda, I have a bio here for Linda. I'm going to share with you. Um, so this is drawn um, essentially from uh, Linda's uh, syllabus for the class. So I wanted to expose all of you to the to the kind of give you that overview of the content. Um, this is her bio. Dr. Linda Denno is an associate dean of the University of Arizona, where two of her programs have been designated National Centers of Academic Excellence. Dr. Denno received her PhD in political science from the University of California, Davis, her MA in government from Claremont Graduate School and her BA in political science from the California State University. The university teaching career includes courses in American politics and institutions, political philosophy, constitutional law, cyber law and ethics, and national security studies. Taught at the University of California, the State University of New York, SUNY. I went to SUNY Binghamton as undergrad. Uh -huh. um, and California State University. Uh, Dr. Denno has earned numerous awards for teaching and for university and community service in more than 35 years in higher education. And thank you so much, Linda, for agreeing to teach this course for us. Uh, wouldn't mind a class on cyber law either. We'll have to follow up. With you on that. <laughs> I'm teaching a graduate course in cyber law policy and ethics in the fall for the first time. I've taught it at an undergraduate. I'm teaching it as a graduate course in the fall. So let's see how that goes. And then we'll <laughs> we'll we'll put it up in the future. Uh, it's, and, a fun, um, it's, it's a fun and very quickly uh, evolving course i just figured out i had to add a whole bunch about chat gpt into it we'll leave that one alone for now mm. yeah chat gpt is pretty interesting i just started dabbling with that today for the first time and and i have to say it's at least within my area of expertise it kind of tends to give like high school junior level responses i mean they're not terrible but they're not quite right either um but we'll have to see how that develops it certainly looks interesting all right, so American Law Courses uh, starts May 17th. They're at 7 p.m. Eastern time, so 4 p.m. Pacific time. They're every Wednesday for, I believe it's 14 consecutive classes followed by the optional final exam. By the way, folks, the final exam should be thought of as an opportunity for you to demonstrate to yourself that you've actually mastered the material. It's not, a, we're not planning to fail anybody. I mean, it has to be hard enough so it's possible to fail, but we don't want you to fail. We'll do everything in our power to make sure that you pass so long as you've been a reasonably diligent student and done your share of the work. So the first class, uh, oh, this is an overall description of the course. So the course is designed to provide an understanding of the liberties and rights contained within and protected by constitutional guarantees, primarily in the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment. We'll discuss the theory and structure of the Constitution, examine the role of the courts, especially, of course, the Supreme Court in interpreting the Constitution, a role it took upon itself. <laughs> I'll say as an aside, a primary emphasis will be upon understanding the judicial doctrines that the Supreme Court has expanded, how those doctrines have influenced constitutional protection, civil rights and civil liberties. And as citizens, and I certainly concur with this, it's important to understand the basic foundations of our civil rights and liberties, how these are guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution and the role of the Supreme Court, how well it functions in that role, which is not always very well. Uh, sometimes it's terrible in protecting our most fundamental rights and freedoms. And the course starts with May 17th, Introduction, Constitutional Interpretation of the Supreme Court and Constitutional Adjudication. So this is a, a quote here 
uh, from uh, Chief Justice John Marshall. Uh, I'm not going to read the co quote. While we're talking, uh, folks can read it on the screen if they like. Uh, but perhaps you could give an overview of generally what you'll be covering in this this first class of the con law. So the the Madison tells us that the problem you have with constitutions is that they you said it yourself. It's a piece of paper. Parchment, mere parchment barriers is something that uh, Madison does to refer to uh, what a constitution standing alone, no matter how well it's drawn up, it does nothing to enforce itself. And it does nothing even to interpret itself. As you pointed out, that requires somebody to do it. And the question then becomes who's going to interpret it? Who's going to interpret it? That's the first question. And the second is, by what standards? By what standards will it be interpreted? So what we've had happen fairly early in our republic is, is uh, Marbury versus Madison, the very famous case wherein from which this quote is drawn and wherein Chief Justice John Marshall established for the Supreme Court the power to review acts of Congress, uh, acts of the president, um, and compare those acts, those pieces of legislation, et cetera, to the Constitution, comparing one against the other and determining that the Constitution must take precedence over any mere piece of legislation or action by, say, the president. That, of course, is kind of a given in a society that is committed to a written Constitution. If you don't, it's fundamental law. If you don't hold the Constitution at, at the highest place, you may as well not have a constitution at all. You think about, say, Great Britain. They have no written constitution. It's really just a whole series of legislative acts, uh, some, ju some judicial rulings and so on. But it changes over time and it, there's no permanency to it. In our, we have a written constitution. Who gets to decide what that constitution means and how to interpret it? And Lincoln, of course, the constitution was ratified, what, 1787? And the Bill of Rights? 1789. 1789, Bill of Rights, was, 1791. Uh, mm -hmm. So Madison, uh, Marbury versus M Madison didn't happen until 1803. There were a lot of years that went by without the Supreme Court exerting this authority. Without the Supreme Court exerting much authority at all. In fact, when we talk about Marbury in the class, is a really interesting discussion about Marshall's um, very clever, very, um, <laughs> what's a good way to put it? It's actually masterful the way he, he takes a decision like uh, that, that that comes up in Marbury and uses it to establish for the Supreme Court the power to declare acts by the other two branches unconstitutional. It was never really an issue, let me just as an aside, that there should be a court that could determine that acts of the states that violated the United States Constitution, that, that they should have the ability to decide that. A little bit of a little bit of controversy, but in a in a federal system, the federal or national constitution has to be supreme. But when you're talking about three co-equal branches of government in and in many cases, the judiciary, as we'll learn, is considered the least of the three branches of government. What gives us the Supreme Court uh, the power to decide for the other two branches what the Constitution means? Lincoln tells us nothing. He, he, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll, we'll see that when, when he's talking about the Dred Scott decision. He says, yeah, okay, we'll listen to the court in this case, but it doesn't have any uh, larger political or legislative meaning. It's not the final word on the Constitution. We don't, we don't buy into that position anymore, but it's always worth looking at. But in the meantime, how did, how did they get there? Well, Marshall does something really clever. At a time when the court... Let's see, John Jay, who had been the first Supreme Court Chief Justice, left to go do something else. He was asked to come back by John Adams to take on the Supreme, the Chief Justiceship of the Supreme Court. And he refused, saying it was never going to amount to anything, basically. It, it had no <laughs> power. Um, Congress had uh, canceled a couple of its um, terms. The kinds of, it had a couple of significant cases, but um, you know, it was no, nobody was paying too much attention to it. And so what Marshall does in this case is he overturns an act of Congress that doesn't require anybody to do anything to make it happen. And then the Supreme Court doesn't actually overturn another act of Congress for, um, let me do my math, uh, 54 years, more than half a century. 
until the Dred Scott case, actually. So, so at the beginning, there's a lot of, hmm, what would you say, uh, uncertainty about how this really is going to work. Mar Marshall establishes in, in the Marbury case the Supreme Court's power of, the judici of judicial review, but he exercises it very carefully. And then what happens subsequent to that, Marshall stays on the court until 1833 um, and decides many, many important cases after that. But none of them actually overturn acts of Congress. Quite a few of them uphold uh, congressional exercises of power. You can think of, say, McCulloch versus Maryland and some others. But... Um, Never again does Marshall participate or decide a case that overturns an act of Congress. And we'll, we'll talk about those distinctions and so on. But it, it's also, I think, really important as we go throughout the whole semester to keep in mind what it was Marshall did in Marbury versus Madison and in some of the subsequent important cases that he decides and what we saw the court do, for instance, in in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where for the create um, create rights out of whole cloth, create judicial remedies for rights, and have them take on the same importance as anything you find actually explicitly in the Bill of Rights. Something say like the exclusionary rule. Um, assuming everybody knows what that is, because if you've ever watched a cop show, um, you'll know that the exclusionary rule is that thing that says if the cops do something. Um, that that violates the Fourth Amendment as they are collecting evidence for a case, as they're collecting a confession, so on. If if it's determined that they somehow violated one of the Bill of Rights, that evidence can't be used in court. And that's a wonderful judicial remedy that helps only um, the guilty and never actually does much for innocent for the innocent in any given case. So we'll talk about some of those things and how the court came to uh, exercise a very different kind of power by, by the time we have the Warren court and again in the 1950s. And those are some interesting things. One last thing I'll say about that, Andrew, really quickly is that right now we're in, I'm sure you see this as well, what I would call a kind of different situation than when I first started studying constitutional law back in the 70s, um, where the Supreme Court could do no wrong. And, you know, so, so maybe people on the left would complain a little about this or that decision, but Roe versus Wade and many other, the, the affirmative action cases, all of these cases where the left's political priorities that they couldn't get in many cases through the political process. They went to the courts and they got what they wanted from the courts and especially from the Supreme Court. What we're finally seeing is a court, it's not perfect, but it's turning some of that back to uh, at least to a little extent. And you're seeing backlash against the court in ways you haven't seen ever before. Um, maybe, maybe by in the South, uh, when you had the impeach Earl Warren for the busing cases and so on, but really you're seeing the left saying, Oh, wait a minute. You mean they're not always going to decide cases the way we want them to. Maybe we should get rid of the Supreme court. Maybe we should put ethics rules on them. Maybe we should have time limit, you know, on and on and on. So sure. Pack the court. I mean, yeah, do whatever is necessary to get them back to where they're doing our bidding basically. And I obviously skipped one major exception to that, which was during the Roosevelt years. But again, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the course. So um, it's and just of course an interesting we, time. We, we just accept these policies as if they, this is the only way the world could exist, right? That the Supreme mm -hmm. Court has this authority, that the uh, exclusionary rule for a uh, uh, Fourth Amendment search and seizure violations, the evidence can't be admissible in court. Like Miranda, Miranda writes, we just accept that as, well, how could it possibly be any other way? But Miranda was not a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court. There, there was a dissent and it, it made compelling arguments that Miranda was not a good way to go. And in any case, it's a policy decision. Um, policy decision. Right. And, and, and further, I would just go one step further, Andrew, and say, it's not as if states police forces, uh, how, state legislatures went out there and said whatever to, to law enforcement officials, whatever you do, whatever you do, don't let suspects know their constitutional fourth, fifth and sixth amendment rights, whatever you do. No, as you put it, they created a policy. They created a policy that 
what had actually had been um, an FBI tool that they had been using for some time. And they just decided to enforce that policy on every law enforcement agency, local, state and federal throughout the United States. That's not the role of the Supreme Court and never was. So you have, but like you say, we, what, what do we do? Congress actually at one point uh, passed legislation to uh, tell, <laughs> tell the Supreme Court, no, we're not going to put up with this anymore. And the Supreme Court overturned the legislation. <laughs> you know, they're, they don't like losing power. I'll just leave it at that. And nobody does, but nobody does, right? That's part right. of the dynamic of having all these things done by actual human beings. But I promise everyone here that the the story, uh, the, the the it's it really is a story. They could make a wonderful movie about it. The story behind Marbury versus Madison is actually really interesting, very exciting. It's got twists and turns. So. Uh, it's it's not a boring look at a boring old 1803 case. It's it, the one of the most important events in 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 history. Also has its share of drama, I guess I should say. So we'll talk about that too. Now, just as we were talking about, you know, the Supreme Court doesn't have to have this authority. That's just not uh, fated to happen. Exclusionary rules not fated to happen. Miranda is not fated to be the rule. Uh, the Bill of Rights itself is not fated uh, to exist. Uh, and you mentioned this earlier, but I love this quote from Hamilton. So I'll, I'll read this one aloud. This is from, of course, Alexander Hamilton. And he's basically questioning, why do we even need a Bill of Rights? There, there could be negative consequences to, to taking this approach. Uh, quote, I go further and affirm that bill, bills of rights in the sense and in the extent in which they are contended for are not only unnecessary in the proposed Constitution, but would even be dangerous. They would contain various exceptions to powers which are not granted, and on this very account would afford a colorable pretext to claim more than was granted. For why declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do? Why, for instance, should it be said that the liberty of the press shall not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be imposed. I will not contend that such a provision would confer a regulating power, but it is evident that it would furnish to men disposed to usurp, which is all men, really, a plausible pretense for claiming that power. And we certainly see this in the context of the Second Amendment. Absolutely, all of the time. But maybe a, a simpler way, a simpler uh, example of this might be Ah, the First Amendment freedom of religion again in the Obamacare case and the, the regulations that, you know, how many thousands of pages of regulations were promulgated to put into place the Affordable Care Act. You all remember that one of those regulations changed the way that insurance companies uh, had to offer their um, the, the benefits of their policies. And one of those was a guarantee that insurance companies would uh, pay for abortion on demand. And it also required employers to buy insurance that provided that um, benefit. And, you know, there were several cases that went before the Supreme Court, but the question there should never have been, the, the niceties of, you know, well, what's the policy really doing this and that? It should have been the, the, you know, the federal government has no power to tell a private insurance company or a private corporation hiring an insurance company, contracting with an insurance company, what they have to provide. I mean, we, we lost the whole point of it, which was, no, of course the federal government doesn't have that power. Um, and then instead we try to carve out a little protection for, you know, the sisters of, I forget what they were sisters of. <laughs> the, right. you know, the little but, sisters? The little sisters of. Forget, something. Right. Something. Yes. But I mean, why are we trying to carve out these tiny little exceptions um, in the name of First Amendment religious liberties, when in fact the government never had those powers in the first place, and so that's why I say that you know maybe Hamilton had a was had a certain prescience there. It's still a tough call to say we'd be better off without a Bill of Rights. I don't think I believe that, but it's an interesting intellectual journey to 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 look at that. I think. Right. It's it's it, it, 
it's almost a chicken and egg problem, right? Because you, mm -hmm. you, you arguably don't need a Bill of Rights unless you have a government that's overreaching beyond its enumerated powers. But once you have a government that's overreaching beyond its enumerated powers, then what's going to stop them but for a Bill of Rights? I mean, this is what we see in places like Canada and Britain, uh, where where the their versions of the legislature can basically do anything they want. Yep. Um, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, you, when you said chicken or the egg, not only that, but... Uh, is the existence of a Bill of Rights a factor in a government that's disposed to usurp rights? Or is it the thing that keeps them from usurping rights as long as the citizens are vigilant about it? You know, that's, it's, a, it's a really tough question. And again, the best we can do, I think, is exactly what we're trying to do here. Remind citizens that, you know, that these rights are not given to you by government. You said it yourself. The Second Amendment does not give people the right to keep and bear arms. It acknowledges and insists that Congress cannot take away that right. And those are two very, very different things. But I, I, I challenge you to find a 20-something-year-old out there who has even the least knowledge about um, their constitutional system of government and so on, who can even tell you that yeah, where rights come from. That, right. I mean, you, we frequently see these interviews on the street, right, asking people simple legal questions, and they, they simply have no idea. Then they couldn't care less. Um, so, of course, you know, American law courses, folks, they're rigorous. I hope you get a sense of that. Um, but uh, they are designed for, you know, lay people, for American citizens who want to learn this stuff, who want to make the effort to learn it at this kind of law school level. And I did see a question in the chat about... Um, if these classes are being taught at the law school level, is there a textbook that we, we requi require you to buy? The answer is we're, we're trying to do these courses without having you buy a law school textbook. And the reason is uh, a, a key part of what we're trying to do is make this information, this expertise, this education available to you at as low a cost as possible. If you if you get the bundle of all the courses for American law courses, they, they work out to about $500 a class. A law school textbook, could almost be five hundred dollars by itself. Yeah. Well, so, and and let me add a little to that, Andrew. My my own theory on this, my my practice more than anything, is that um, I don't need you to read somebody else's opinion about what a case means or does. A little bit of it that is my job to help you look at the important parts about it. But in most of the classes I teach, I use primary sources. Once in a while, find really interesting articles that, you know, put that put a different spin on things. It's kind of interesting to look at. But I tend to uh, I tend to want to give you the opportunity to look at things and make your own decisions. Again, I'll try to help you um, see see what's important, understand what what isn't easily understood. But there's one other thing. When I first took constitutional law, I believe the first time was in 1979. You know, I had a, a case law book. If I wanted to get the whole, um, the entire decision, because most case law books will edit them down, I had to go to the to the library and check out, or excuse me, not check out, sit in the library right. and read <laughs> the the case, uh, the Supreme Court case, or once in a while a federal appellate court case. And that um, meant taking a physical book off a shelf, folks. Off a shelf and not being able to check it out because they were resource books. They couldn't come out of the library, um, which is fine. You know, it, it was probably a good thing. But but guess what? Every single Supreme Court case, every single federal appellate court case, any case that we'd have any reason whatsoever to take be taking a look at is available um, open source on the internet. And I'll, I, I, I promised Emily I'd do this. I just have not had a chance to do it yet. I will actually put those links in the syllabus so that you don't even have to go looking for them. Um, it, the, sometimes there'll be uh, case briefs, uh, some different um, internet sites have some decent enough case briefs that will just tell you what the basic issues are in the case. Sometimes the problem with that is we are not necessarily looking at what the decision in a case is. Sometimes we are. Sometimes we're not. We're actually looking at maybe it's the concurrence. Maybe it's the dissent. Maybe it's this dictum over here that became the basis for a uh, major judicial doctrine. So it's not always enough to, to go to the case briefs that are available online. It's really good, I think, to the extent that you have time to do so, to read the cases themselves. 
Um, I, I just think that that's important because this isn't, this isn't about indoctrination. This is about learning. Um, and the way you do that isn't just to listen to me. And it's not just to read some, some textbook with an editor that has a specific ideological or political or judicial philosophy bent in mind and then you know funnels what you see and what you read. Uh, I'm sort of opposed to that in a very basic way. So you won't have to buy anything in this course. Everything will be made available for you with a simple click of a button. And I, I'm always telling people to go read the cases. Every time I cover a decision, I link to the case, uh, even if it's just some routine court of appeals decision, but especially these controlling decisions by the Supreme Court, and especially the ones that have a dissent. Folks, I love dissents because that's, the, that's what enables you to engage in genuine critical thinking about these cases. If there's no dissent, and one of the reasons I fell in love with Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court was his beautifully written dissents when, when he was so often in the minority, uh, because you don't really understand the issue unless you've heard both sides of the argument. And if there's no dissent, you're only hearing the winning side of the argument. And you, you haven't learned to critically think about that question. Now, you may disagree with the dissent. You may agree with the majority. That's fine. But reading the dissent is what gives you the tools you need to be critically engaged on that issue and understand it in, in a genuinely comprehensive way. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and the other thing, let me give you an example of even if there's not a dissent, but how reading, reading the entire case and analyzing the case will give you an entirely different perspective. So the very famous case of Brown versus Board of Education, which we'll, we will be discussing very late in the semester, we all know what that case was about. It ended legal segregation, de jure segregation in public schools that, you know, and we all know that we're also told from time to time that it was the sort of impetus to the getting the civil rights movement up and off the ground that in a way that culminated in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. All of that's true. But if you actually read Brown versus Board of Education, it's a very interesting thing. Brown versus Board of Education is said to have overturned a case called Plessy versus Ferguson, which you may have heard of as well, an 1896 case out of Louisiana that um, looked at the question of whether or not Jim Crow laws, you know, laws that segregated on the basis of race were constitutional. And the court there said that they were, uh, for reasons, again, when we get there, we'll talk about it in a little more detail. The dissent in that case is, uh, if you see the syllabus, I actually quote from that dissent, um, by Justice John Harlan, uh, where he talks about a colorblind constitution. In 1954, when the court in Brown versus Board of Education decided that legal segregation was unconstitutional, they didn't do so because they believed in a colorblind constitution. Rather, they relied upon social science data. They, they brought in this sociologist who said that, or psychologist, I forget, who said that when you handed little uh, black children white dolls and you handed them black dolls, they had a higher opinion of the white dolls, which led him to believe that segregated schools um, made little black children feel bad, okay? And as the court put it, affects their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. What it really comes down to is Brown versus Board of Education did not overturn Blessy versus Ferguson because it didn't institute a colorblind constitution. And if you wonder why it is today that we can have, say, separate graduations for people of different colors and ethnicities, a lot of that has to do with the court's really horrible reasoning in Brown versus Board of Education, where they just base the idea that that racism or uh, prejudice or unconstitutional discrimination is really only happening when there's stigma involved, when somebody who's a minority feels bad about it. So if you're a white person, uh, you can't be discriminated against. You wonder where all that comes from. Andrew talked about DIE at the beginning. I like to put it that way. It works better <laughs> for me. Um, 
but that's where that all comes from. That that the the diversity, inclusion, and equity is not about a colorblind constitution. It's not about treating people equally, regardless of the color of their skin or any of those immutable characteristics of birth. It's about the government picking and choosing who gets to be stigmatized and who doesn't. Um, and, and Brown led the way. I, most people don't even realize what a terrible, terrible decision Brown is. Um, so, Linda, I'm going to I'm going to speed through because I'd, I'd like oh, to try yeah. to wrap up close to the top of the hour. I don't want to keep it too long, but I'm going to speed through the rest of the syllabus just so folks can see what's being covered. And then I'd like to take a few questions, if we could, from uh, from folks in the audience. So this is only the second class here from May 24th, folks. Uh, there's a lot more that's covered. Uh, we go on to uh, talking about substantive due process, selective incorporation, which of the Bill of Rights applied to the states, for example. That wasn't obvious. These were restrictions on the federal government, not necessarily on the state, gov uh, state governments. To the extent they're now applied to the states, we call that incorporation. Uh, we go on from there to, whoops, sorry, First Amendment, freedom of speech, press, and association. From there, we go on to First Amendment, freedom of religion. Then the Second Amendment, Dear to my heart, indeed, the fourth, fifth and sixth amendment. So search and seizure under the fourth, uh, self-incrimination, double jeopardy under the fifth. The sixth is uh, right to counsel, jury trial, uh, speedy trial. Uh, what am I forgetting? Um, confront your accusers, all that kind of jazz uh, under the sixth amendment. Um, then we get to we skip the seventh amendment because that's uh jury right in civil trials. It's not that big a deal these days. Uh, Eighth Amendment has to do with cruel and unusual punishment, which of course covers the death penalty near and dear to uh, our good friend Steve Gosney's heart. He's dealing with a lot of death penalty issues right now in his work. Uh, uh, then we get uh, away from the, the Bill of Rights. We get to the Equal Protection Clause, which is in the Constitution itself. Uh, the right to privacy. Interesting. That'll be great. Uh, and then, of course, we get to ultimately to the final exam at the end, which is optional, folks. You don't have to take the final exam unless you want to get that uh, certification at the end. But I would encourage you to take it, folks. That You'll know you really learn this stuff when you when you sail through that final exam. And one and again, thing I'd all, add really quick, Andrew, is that um, there's a list of cases, as you saw, uh, that was up to date when I sent Emily the syllabus. I'm anticipating a couple, adding a couple based upon that there's a very important affirmative action case coming before uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, well, already went before the Supreme Court. Arguments have been heard. It should it will definitely be um that I can't imagine they'll put off the decision. That decision should be issued uh, near the end of the Supreme Court's term in June. So we'll have it by the time we reach that in early August. Yeah. One thing we always encourage with all our professors is we, we to a reasonable extent, we allow the interest of the students to help drive the curriculum as well. So if the, if the students express a strong interest in a subject that may not have been in the syllabus when it was drafted months earlier, uh, we make adjustments on the fly to make sure that we're targeting the interest of, uh, of the students in the class. And we give all our professors the uh, discretion to make those kind of calls. Uh, so let me take a quick look and see what kind of questions may have come in. Oh, why don't you mention uh, Lucretia? Can you talk about that? So, so I am actually a dean at the University of Arizona, um, and how do I say this? I am not never embarrassed about my uh, political views, my my constitutional views. I, I am with my students. I don't I don't pretend any diversity nonsense or anything like that. But I don't go out of my way to be partisan because I don't think that's any more my role than I think that that professors on the left should do so. However, you know, I have very strong views. I am on a podcast with an, um, a, an old friend of mine from graduate school. And now we've added a, a, a second lawyer from Berkeley, the, the other conservative lawyer from Berkeley Law School to our podcast. But way back when my friend Steve Hayward, with whom I did the podcast, do the podcast, he 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 thought it'd be funny if I had uh, a nom de plume, uh, uh, you know, uh, use a pen name, and he wanted to call me Professor X, but I am not a fan <laughs> of um, I am not a fan of uh, science fi movies, sci fi movies, or anything like that. And I said, no, I don't want to be that. And I, on the fly, I came up with 
Lucretia, who is um, was a Roman matron who saved the Roman Empire. Uh, Shakespeare has a, a narrative poem about her. Plutarch wrote about her. She was a real person. Like I say, she saved the Roman Empire. So um, I, I chose that. My old mentor said that was incredibly pretentious and presumptuous of me, but <laughs> it stuck. So that's that's where the name comes from. I'm not embarrassed, but nobody can ever say that um, – I, my views, I am representing the University of Arizona when I do so. Most everybody knows who I am. You know, I get emails from, from people who listen to the podcast all the time. They figure out who I am. It's not a huge mystery, but nobody can say that as a dean from the University of Arizona, I'm out there, you know, uh, espousing these horrible views, which they all think that's true. So. Fair enough. Okay. A couple questions here. Um, a prospective student is asking kind of an administrative question. Uh, is the course live with videotaped backup? So these courses are streamed live at the scheduled time. Uh, they typically last somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half has been our experience. Uh, and of course, we do record the stream. So um, if you if you have a scheduling conflict, you can't make a particular class, you'll be able to watch the stream during dur during that week to make up for it. Uh, and then collectively, for all the classes, if you're a registered student, you keep access to the streamed versions for a year after the course. So you can review it again. You can take the courses at your leisure. You can take courses, uh, classes, individual classes a second time if you wish. Um, so all of that is available as a recorder playback. Uh, and for all our courses, if you if you were to sign up for criminal law today, for example, uh, we taught criminal law. Steve Gosney taught criminal law last fall. Uh, what you would receive is the recorded playback of that immediately upon registering for the class, all, all 14 classes in the semester of criminal law, plus you'd get a, a bonus ticket to the next live class of criminal law the next time it comes up in the cycle. Uh, so that's how we're organizing that. Um, let's see. Let me look through the, the YouTube questions. Yes, I'm wearing a tie. I'm wearing a tie, just like just like you have to distinguish between your uh, University of Arizona persona uh, and uh, uh, things you might write about from personal interest on a podcast. Uh, I also have to differentiate when I'm being serious about the law and when I'm just having fun on the internet. And uh, when I'm just having fun on the internet, I don't wear a tie. So that's everyone's indication. If they see me wearing a tie, I'm being serious. Uh, if I'm not wearing a tie, I'm just having fun. So they, they've started calling those shows No Tie Branca. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, some of these are very technical questions. Uh, the, the people with the technical questions, I would recommend that you sign up for the class. That would be a great place to ask those. Not, not in the last few minutes. Let them know that I can't see the chat, so I can't help. Right, right. Um, you, know what, you know what I can do is let me do this. In... Um, do you see on the right side of uh, your screen there's something that says comments? No. Oh, you don't see that. Okay. Um, it's okay. I, 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 we don't. I know you don't want to keep this going forever, and I'm, I trust you to do it. I just wanted people to know that I'm not ignoring the chat because I can't see it. It's up to you to decide what you're going to take the time to do and not do. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. It is your show, Andrew. Well, I think those are all, so th there's just a lot of chatter and then there's some really in-depth questions that aren't appropriate for this kind of forum that are appropriate for the class. So what I encourage you to do, folks, if, uh, if you'd like to be the best American citizen you can be, if you want to be genuinely informed on the law, especially constitutional law, uh, this is the class for you. It starts up in less than two weeks, May 17th. Now is the time to get on board, save, save $1,000 on this class. Uh, you can pay over time. You can sign up for a bundle of classes. Pick whatever classes you want from our curriculum. Uh, the more classes you sign up for, the less expensive they become with each class. A and this is, you've spent an hour with Linda now. This is the degree of expertise and insight you get into constitutional law. You will have a masterful understanding of constitutional law by taking this class and really be a genuinely well-informed citizen on your rights, and I hope would be motivated to pursue even further education in the Constitution moving forward from this class. 
All right, Linda. Well, you, know, you know, one other quick thing, Andrew, if you don't, just one sure. quick thing. So one of the other things that's really hap interesting in the law schools these days, they're mostly, of course, uh, bastions of progressivism. And, you know, they do things like critical legal theory, and uh, we won't go into all that right now. But a really interesting thing has been happening, and this actually comes from the Supreme Court down, the idea that we should be interpreting the Constitution from an originalist perspective. What's most interesting about that is that there are very few professors in law school who understand enough about originalism, the idea that you look to the actual words, text, legislative history, uh, historical context of the Constitution in order to understand what it is the Constitution means as you interpret it, as a judge interprets it. We've had the opposite, the living constitution, the constitution is what the judges say it is as a judicial philosophy for so long that there aren't very many law professors who can actually teach originalism, but some conservative federalist society people mostly are offering courses in originalism. So we will, I, I haven't put that specifically into any of the syllabus, but we will be discussing that because there's a really interesting idea. The debate there is now, even on the Supreme Court, if you ever watch any of the, um, the oral arguments, the debate is all in the context of originalism and what that means. Even, right. even the progressive judges have to debate now, what does the Constitution really mean here? And how do we know what it means? And, and what should be our our sources for information about what the constitution means. So that's going to be something we're going to talk about. And if you go to law school and understand the doctrine of originalism and all its different forms, you would be way more prepared than most of your uh, fellow law students. I will tell you that. And of course, if the constitution is not moored, anchored in the history of the times, it's not anchored to anything. I mean, it could be then it could be anything. It could be the, the political preferences, the whims of the moment. I mean, we certainly see that in our current era in terms of having suddenly uh, in, in the last three or four years, we've gone from two genders to 57 or however many genders we have today. Uh, <laughs> absent historical context. But of course, there's a lot of I mean, most people don't study history anymore. That just doesn't happen. And, and it doesn't especially happen just because somebody goes to law school or becomes a law professor. They, they could learn all that law stuff. And not know any history, uh, which is going to make interpretation of the Constitution pretty difficult if it's actually required that it be interpreted in that historic, historical context. All right, Linda, thank you so much for being on. Uh, by the way, uh, if you'd like more of Linda, she and I will be on Joe Neerman's show a little bit later tonight. I think it's uh, two hours from now, I think. Um, mm -hmm. It's currently... 6 p.m. Colorado time, Mountain Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I think Joe's uh, is expecting us 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so I'm not sure. You know, Joe runs his own show. Uh, I'll just be there to chatter. Linda will be there to share her expertise and talk about American law courses. And I'm sure we'll have a great time. Joe's always a fun host. Uh, but if you'd like uh, perhaps a different flavor of the two of us in a couple of hours, then I would encourage you to go take a look at uh, Joe Neerman, Good Logic on YouTube, and we'll both be there. All right, Linda. I'll sign off at this point. Thank you so much for being on. I'll see you in a couple of hours. Uh, everybody else, I hope I see all of you in a couple of hours too. Don't let this opportunity pass you by, folks. May 17th, less than two weeks from now, a semester-long law school-level course in constitutional law taught in plain English by Linda, who you just heard for the last hour. Be the best American citizen you can be by learning the actual constitutional law of your country and how it constrains the government and protects your rights. May 17th, AmericanLawCourses.com. We need to see you there, folks. That's the place to be. That's where the cool kids will be hanging out this summer on Wednesday nights. All right, everybody. As always, of course, of course, of course, I remain um, Attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense and American Law Courses. And until next time, stay safe.